Today's Thursday? Yeah. This is Wednesday, September the 6th, 2006. Judy is here, and she wants a recording from way back when. Here I go. I'm her mother, Sarah Grace Wood Owen. I was born on October the 11th, 1915, in Elmore, Ohio, at the home of my maternal grandparents, David and Sarah Ames. My parents were Edith and Glenn Wood. I had two old I had two older brothers. John Hamilton Wood was born December 29, 1908, and died March the 8th, 1999. My other brother was Kenneth. Ames Wood. He was born October, August the 7th, 1911. We lived at Grandma's for four years. I can remember Grandma's house. It was an open stairway and at the top of the stairs was a small room with nursery rhyme wallpaper and that was my room. And then it went into another room which was my brother's room and then on into another room was where mom and dad had their bedroom. At the bottom of the stairs was a big register and above that was a small one which the heat went up and warmed the upstairs. But grandpa was a fireman at the mill so he always had a hot furnace fire. And one morning I came down the stairs and ran across that register and burnt the bottoms of my feet. And I can remember Grandma put me up in the high chair and put apple butter on. It must have worked because I don't remember any problem with my feet later. Grandpa was tall and slim and had a mustache and he smoked a corn cob pipe. And he always, when he went down to the basement, there was a window right by the basement door, and he would leave his corn cob pipe on the windowsill. Well, one day I decided I was going to see what smoking a pipe was like. And I'll tell you, it was horrible. I think I spit for weeks. It was terrible. Grandma was short and fat and had big brown eyes and beautiful snow white curly hair which she always wore pinned up. Grandma was a good cook. I can remember a lot of good things that we had when we were at her, her house, especially chicken and dumplings. And I can remember there was a, a shelf in the dining room that had a clock that struck the hours on, and there was a, a telephone that was the old crank type and had the operator someplace in the area and of course all the neighbors could listen in on your telephone conversations as well as the operator and I think they did too. Grandma had a nice yard with lots of fruit trees. She had pears and apples and peaches and a grape arbor in the back that was oh I suppose maybe 12 feet long, maybe longer than that yet. And it had white grapes and red grapes and Concord grapes. And it was covered, completely covered with the sides and the top. So it made a nice place to play house. There was a big lilac bush by her bedroom window. And that was there for years and years. She had a big garden from the yard crew over to the railroad track and also had chickens. And now, Joyce and Eugene Contact live there, but the yard, the trees, everything's all gone. It's covered just full of, of buildings right up close to the house. And Grandma turned over in her grave as she could see that now. I can remember the some of the people that worked at the factory there, and they were always attentive to the kids in the neighborhood. And I think there's a picture someplace of me sitting up on a barrel 
with dark glasses on, and I, I imagine some of the women that worked there did that. We lived there with Grandma for four years, and during the World War, when First World War, when they had the flu epidemic, um, I had the flu, and my brother Ken said that I almost died, and that was when he decided that he was going to be a doctor, and he did become a doctor in later years. The only thing I remember about it was that my I had a bed or a cot uh, by the window that looked out to the river, over the garden to the railroad track. And I suppose Grandpa told the engineer that I was there, so when they would be there quite a while to switch to another track or something, why the engineer would always blow the whistle and, and wave at me. Mom took the census at that time too, and so she was gone a lot of the time. I can remember in Grandma's living room, she had a leather, probably just a two-seated um, settee or dim or something that had a, a button thing in the middle. It, was, it looked like a pleated pillow or something. We used to play there thinking that that was the steering wheel to, to our car. We lived at Grandma's four years, and then my parents bought the house that I live in now on Rice Street. And it has um, a second floor uh, dormers. My brothers slept upstairs, and I had the end bedroom downstairs. We didn't have any heat in our bedrooms for many, many years. And uh, we'd wake up in the morning in the winter time, and there was ice on the windows, but we always seemed to find a warm place to dress and, and undress. I can remember that I used to lay down on the floor by my bed and stomp my foot, pretending that I'd fallen out of bed. And then my dad would come in and put me back to bed. He didn't ask me why I did it, but I did. There were lots of kids in the neighborhood, and we all played together through the years. We'd roller skate all over town, and in the evenings we played run, sheep, you run, and a lot of games like that, or just sit under the street lights and talk or tell stories or something. And now the kids don't do anything, sit and watch television or... Who were the kids you played with? What were the names of the kids you played with? Well, there was Kenny Lohr lived on the back street by Hazel's, and there was Hazel. They're down on the corner on the opposite side of, of our street. And um, there was Mirth and Violet Dam Shorter, and in later years was Sally Brooke Miller, and um, Sowers is next door. I had Waldemar that was my brother's age, and next door uh, toward town there was often families that lived there that had children. There were Arnella Fox, I remember, and um, Madge Roy lived there at one time. And then in the next house was um, the Richards, and they had Scott and John. And the next lot was vacant, and later Catherine and Nelson Johnson lived there. And the next house was Leonard Fulford, and he was the same age as my brothers. And the next house where Pauline Blasey lived later was a family by the name of Hartlieb, and I don't know, they had a lot of kids. Uh, Emma was probably my age, and then when there was an older girl, and the house was right on the sidewalk at that time, and I remember she used to stand on the other side and then jump out at you when you'd walk by. And the next place was a little house that set way in the back of the lot, and that was Mr. Sorrowine. I think he must have been a bachelor. I don't ever remember any lady there. And then on the corner in the big brick house was Willie's, and Claude was a little bit older than I am. We always laughed because it seemed like there was a street light at every young person's house, 
and not where the old people lived. So we always laughed about that. Scott Richards had a pony when I was a kid, and so did um, Frederick Stifler that lives out where Shadell's is now. And Frederick used to come in, and, and he would pull us in the wintertime. He'd pull us on our sleds. And Mom always told that we had our supper about 6 o'clock because my father worked in Toledo and didn't get home earlier. And in the wintertime, it's dark at 6 o'clock. And I wasn't home for supper. And nobody seemed to be concerned about it until Mom said, well, maybe somebody's picked her up by now. And she said, boy, my brothers flew out just like that and went out to find me. We used to go coasting down at, at Reed's Hill, down on the other end of town. And sometimes we, if the boys were with us, we'd walk across um, the river and go coasting over at Avers. Or we'd go down at the west end of our street to Kobo's. And, um, but I don't think even kids coast anymore. I've never even seen a kid on a sled for a long time. We roller skated, and on the other end of town, uh, I think Hennessy's lived there in later years, but on that corner, Matt Bader and his wife lived there, and they didn't like kids. And he'd do everything he could to keep us off his sidewalk to keep us from skating past there. What house was that? What house was that? Where Hennessy's lived on the corner. Oh. Yeah. Okay. And Matt Bader was, he had a shoe repair shop at the end of the alley. Oh, well, it's a municipal building now, but it used to be the old fire station. And at the end of that alley, it was a little building, and he had a, was a shoe cobbler. Um, I can remember my brother Ken telling that at Halloween, Matt was in his outhouse so that they wouldn't tip it over, and my brother and the other big boys tipped it over with him in it, so. Why, do you keep, why don't you use a new one? I think it was 1925 when the new bridge was built, and we used to go down there and hang over the railing on that and watch the things go floating by in the river and uh, I got a real pretty scarf and tam for Christmas one year and we were down there hanging over the railing and my hat blew off and went in the river and I'm not sure my mother ever did know what happened to my hat but we used to wade in the river and play along there that never was very deep but kind of dirty you'd never do it today I guess Then there was the streetcar that over the bridge and at the top of that, of the hill there on the left hand side, there was a station for um, the streetcar. And we used to get on the streetcar on Sunday afternoons and go down to Oak Harbor to the um, movie. Oh, I And maybe three or four of girls that go together. And I think probably the movie cost a dime. The stores were open downtown on Wednesday nights and Saturday nights, and my cousin Irene, who was just a year younger than I am, we'd go downtown, and she never had any money, but my dad would usually give me a quarter or something, and so we'd go into Mrs. Guthrie's restaurant, which was next to the Bank of Elmore, and we could get a tin roof for a dime, a big dip of ice cream with uh, any kind of dope that you wanted on it and then peanuts on top and um, that was our big deal for Wednesdays and Saturdays. Sometimes they had open air movies where the fire station is now and they had wooden benches out there and then on Saturday nights they'd have a movie. I can remember it was a serial and it was the Riddle Writer and of course that was exciting. We went to church. We were regular attenders at church, and uh, the Methodist church. 
and we had Christmas, big Christmas programs, and then when they did some first uh, changing of the building, I think they built that first back part on there. Um, we had church at the Opera House downtown, and the Sunday School Superintendent was Mr. Gemberling, who also had a newspaper. And I can remember he used to put his hands behind his back and sway back and forth and pray and pray and pray. So Mama sent us off on time to go to Sunday school, but we'd always dilly-dally along the way so that we'd be late and miss his prayer. Hmm. That before they remodeled that back part where the choir loft, and that is, that was down a few steps, and there was one room that had uh, a pot belly stove, I can remember that. And, um, I missed one Sunday, and Mabel Holkamp was my teacher, and the next week why she wanted to know why I wasn't there. And I had a bad habit of being too busy to go to the bathroom, so often I had wet pants. And my mother thought, well, she'd punish me for not letting me go to Sunday school. So I proceeded to tell the teacher that I didn't have any clean underwear for Sunday school, so I couldn't come. It wasn't quite the truth. <laughs> we had an active Airpress League, and um, Charlie Kuhlman owned a cottage at Lakeside, so in the summertime we could go down to that cottage for the big conference of leagues, and we always had a lot of fun down there. Um, What'd your family do for Christmas? What'd your family do for Christmas? Did they decorate a lot? Well, on the holidays, let's see, I mentioned Halloween. We used to go door to door for trick or treat, and people would let you in then, and they'd try to guess who you were, and um, and you always got a lot of candy or cookies, goodies, apples, and um, for Christmas. We always had a live Christmas tree, and I don't ever remember having candles, but I suppose we did. And then later we had the electric lights, and always we always had a fire in the fireplace. And we weren't allowed to go in the living room until after uh, we'd had our breakfast, and then we could go in the living room and open our presents. We never opened them on Christmas Eve like some people do, because we always had the program at church on Christmas. And Mom always felt that it was too much excitement to come home and open gifts and then expect us to go to bed and sleep. And we never went away for Christmas. Grandma used to like to want us to come down there, but Mom said, no, you can come here, but we're not going away on Christmas. And we always got nice things, um, usually what we had on our list. I remember one year when my brother was in manual training at school, high school, he made a dollhouse for me and it was open in the back and I had all uh, real nice furniture in each room and I think eventually I shouldn't have, but I gave that to Jeanette and Nissa's little sister. They lived down on the corner on the other side of the street where Eggers lived. And I should have kept it, but you don't think about that when you're a kid. And I had nice dolls. I can remember a Bilo baby doll that I got. That was probably my last doll. And I mentioned that it looked just like Mr. Vorce. And he lived or, uh, lived down by St. John's Church. And he worked at the automobile place in Genoa. Well, my father didn't drive a car. And he took the um, streetcar to his office in Toledo. And one night he came home and he said, well, I met Mr. Vores today. And he said, Sarah Grace was right. He does look like her doll. <laughs> Dad didn't drive a car until well, probably I was in high school. And he always said he had too much of a temper. Today we'd call it road rage. But he hated the trucks on the road. And he said he'd try to run them all off. So I guess it was just as well that he didn't drive. We walked 
to the school and from the first to the through the fourth grade the school was on the corner across from the multiplex and Miss Reese was my first and second grade teacher and right at the front of the room was a door into the library and that was often a jar and the high school kids were in there doing things and I had long curls and always had a big hair bow and this one day my hair bow came untied and Miss Reese tied it but I proceeded to untie it because it was a cat bow so I got scolded and shook up for that and it happened that the Helwig girls were in the library so my mother knew it before ever I got home from school they had told it in the third and fourth grade I had Esther Gonski who was later married Harold Kuhlman <clears throat> and Harold's mother died while we were in that room and Mr. Green the school superintendent took over while she was away and I can still remember a story that he told about this boy that was so tall and he had a nosebleed and they had to get a stepladder to get up to turn off his nose some days I wish I had that and then in the fifth grade we moved to the new school and Mabel Rosine was our fifth grade teacher and then in the sixth grade we had Daisy Wainwright and then we moved around to another little wing where there was a seventh and eighth and an overflow room the seventh grade was Bernice Contock she was Bernice Buck and then she married her name was Contock and um, Dora Coleman had the eighth grade and the overflow room was Honora Marche and it was in the seventh grade that Sally Druckenmiller came from Lindsay her father had died and she lived across the street from us and we were always friends and also Chuck Reimers was born that year when we were in the seventh grade and Margaret his sister was in our class and in the high school Let's see, Peyton Koontz was a science teacher, and Bill Everhart was the math teacher. Miss um, Dexter was an English teacher. Miss Banning was a Latin teacher. And I had two years of high school in Elmore, and then my junior and senior year, I went to Dallas, Texas to a finishing school, the uh, Miss Hockaday School for Girls. And everyone wants to know why I went to Dallas. Well, my father's mother lived across the street from the school. So rather than to be boarding in the school, I stayed with my grandmother. And um, I still correspond with one of the gals that, that I went to school with. And at that time, I didn't know a Jew from a Gentile. And when I'd mentioned the girls that were in the school, I, my aunt, my father's younger sister, lived with her mother there too. And she said, aren't there any Gentiles in the school? I said, I don't know. So, but um, I have an atomizer yet that um, her Marcus gave me for graduation. Mm -hmm. And down about two blocks from the girls' school was Terrell Boys School for Boys. So that was new to me that when you had a party or a dance or that, that um, you invited the boys. The, the boys didn't invite you, you invited them. I only remember going to football games at Terrell. I don't remember any parties or dances. And um, most of the girls who went, probably all the girls who went there were quite wealthy. And the friends that I had were, um, Ruth and Francis Rickenstein, their father owned the largest lumber yard west of the Mississippi. And we used to take the service cars that he had and play tag through the lumber yard. And of course, if you went downtown to shop or to have lunch or anything, all we needed to do was just sign our name. He had accounts at every place, and that was new to me to be able to spend money like that. On graduation, everybody has a party, so I teamed with the Rickensteins and we had a dance out at their uh, country home, which 
was a nice estate. They had a beautiful home. They had a younger brother. And, um, but Mr. and Mrs. Rickenstein were just down-to-earth people. They hadn't always had money. And I remember there was a, a stream that ran through their property, and we used to take the boat and go under the road over to Bradford's, and he was the mayor of, of Dallas at that time. And then there was an island also in the stream, and that had a great big pecan tree on. And um, so we had all the nuts that we wanted. Now you pay six, seven dollars for less than half a pound. Did you come home very much when you were down there? I only came home in the summer, the summer. and then you came by train. And, uh, I remember the when I first went, uh, my grandmother was here, and, and uh, we went back together. And I slept in the upper berth, and she was in the down in that was experience because I'd never been on a slept on a train before. And then I think one year, the next year, I think um, both my grandmother and uh, Ann came, and Ann bought a car, a Willie's Knight, and we drove back. Did you get homesick down there? I don't think I ever was homesick. You were too busy to be homesick. And I enjoyed all the activities and the girls. And you probably wondered about boyfriends over all these years. My first love was Ralph Ling. And he may have been one of the reasons that I went to Dallas to school. I don't know. But um, he came from, you might say, an underprivileged family. But he was always a perfect gentleman. He always bought me a box of candy on special occasions. Of course, he didn't have cars or anything, so just it was a matter of either taking a walk or sitting in the pork swing or something like that. And he later married a very nice girl, and they had one daughter, but he died of a very young age, I think probably a heart problem. And then in high school, uh, I met Mel. The boys in Elmore always went out of town. They went to Woodville or Genoa to go with girls, and the boys from Woodville and Genoa came to Elmore to go with the girls. And Mel and I went together until I went away to school. And I don't remember him writing or anything at that time, but there was a new family that had come into town, the Ward Whaley's, and they lived where um, Low Crumnow lives now, and Father had the hardware store. And I only met Ward at Empress League, probably just a short time before I went to Dallas. I never dated him when I came home, but he always wrote the nicest letters and told me all about what was going on with the church and with the school kids and everything, very interesting. And in Dallas, the uh, Rick and Scene girls that I was friend with had a friend, Warren Sibley, big, tall, skinny guy. And I dated him, and he taught me to shoot a gun, and I thought he was pretty brave because he'd go down and put a can on a post or something, rather with me with, my, with a gun in my hands, and I could have shot him just as well. And he also taught me um, to drive a car. So when I came home the first summer, you had to have five language, or um, yeah, five years of language to graduate from Hockaday. Well, I had two years of French here. No, I had two years of Latin here, and I took two years of French there. But I had to squeeze another year of something in. Well, I started Cicero in Latin, and I couldn't stand that. So that first summer that I was home from school, I took third year French from the superintendent's wife, Mrs. Green. And I was glad I learned to drive the car because when I'd have dad's car to go to French class, I would leave 15 minutes early and I'd go as fast as I could over to Woodville. And Mel was working for can't think of his, it was Artie Emsch's brother anyway, out in the country. 
So I get out there quick to see Mel, and then I come back to French class. Nobody checked the mileage on the car. Apparently not, or the gas tank either. Dad had a charge account at at Lori Dolph's at the bottom of the hill, so the boys used it, and so did I. And um, then I guess I saw Mel during those summers, and then I went into nurses training in Toledo. I had planned to go to Ann Arbor, but in as much as I'd been away two years, I thought I wanted to stay closer to home. So I went in training at St. Vincent's in um, February of 1934. If I had gone in uh, in the fall, I would not have been old enough to take state boards when I graduated, and it would be pretty hard to be out of of classes for very long and and do well in state boards. And it was during that time that Mel went to Washington, D.C. Why? I don't know. But anyway, he wanted me to quit training and to get married. So we went up to my father's office in Toledo. We went together and he asked my dad and my dad said, well, you'll have to see what your mother says, knowing that my mother would say absolutely not. So I stayed in training and Mel went to Washington. I graduated from St. V's in the spring of 37 and had met um, a St. John's football player that I guess I suppose I thought was something wonderful. And after I went to Detroit to work, we were married. Um, the reason I went to Detroit, my brother Ken was in medical school and he was driving ambulance at Highland General Hospital and he said they needed nurses. Well, Toledo hospitals were paying $2 a day for eight hours nursing and Detroit was paying $90 a month with board and room. So that was big money, so I went there. And needless to say that the marriage did not work out. I had two children, Julianne Grace and Jim, and we were divorced in 1942. And that as soon as I was back in Elmore, my mother had rented the house and told them they would have to move, that I was coming back. And as soon as I was back in Elmore, Mel's mother in Woodville wrote to him and told him. So I immediately got a letter from him and asking me that if I wasn't divorced, to get a divorce because he was coming home in the fall and that we would get married. Well, I thought that sounded kind of presumptuous because I had two children, which would make a difference in a marriage, I thought. And we hadn't seen each other for quite some time. And I wrote those concerns, but that didn't seem to deter him. So he did come home in October and we were married. He came home on a Sunday and we were married on Tuesday. The rest is history. Well, why, where was Grandma living that this house was being rented? Grandma was with uh, Aunt Lou and Mr. Stahl in Finley in Florida. They went to Florida in the winter and Grandma drove and kept house and cooked for them. They were both in their 90s. Well, so that probably. was after your dad died. After dad died. Yeah. After, da after yeah. your dad died. Oh, so then she rented the house then in the winter when she, while she was gone. Yeah. Oh, mm -hmm. okay. She went it to Jen and Carol Rader, who had the five and dime. Mm -hmm. Then my dad was killed in, uh, in the office in Little Clothes, uh, um, and he had an office in Cincinnati. And going back at, um, can't write this minute, think where it was. But anyway, it was a foggy morning, and 
um, his car and another car sideswiped, and Dad died of his injuries about two days later, and that was just before you were born. And that happened in October when you were born in January. I just thought of the name of it. It was Kenton, Ohio, when he died at the hospital there. Ken and I got there just before he died. Mom had stayed all night. You asked what my father did for a living. Um, I never could explain it because I don't understand it. But anyway, he was in municipal bonds. And Mom used to say one day we were millionaires and the next day we were going to the poorhouse. But um, I don't think that was quite true because I can't ever remember of wanting for anything. We, um, My parents were never one to lavish things, but we always had whatever we needed and probably a little bit extra. And Mom always had nice things. Dad always bought nice things. They were married on New Year's Day. And Dad always bought her um, nice jewelry or I remember the set of sterling silver and and I think our first car was a Willie's Night, a big box, I can remember. And Ken and I had measles at that time, so the rest of the family took a ride, and we had to stay home. And, um, Did he buy her the dishes? The dishes were accumulated over the years. If you look at them, there are dates on the bottom of them. And I don't think uh, that... I don't know whether you couldn't afford or you didn't. They're all hand painted, and on the backs you'll find dates, and they date from before I was born. Laura Tissett in Wellington, Ohio, painted the dishes, and there's only one plate that was missing. And when Raiders lived here, they said Mom didn't need to take the things out of the china cupboard because they wouldn't use them. Well, apparently they did, and one of the the uh, dessert plates was broken, but that's the only piece that's broken. The rest of them are all, well, some of the cups had nicks in right where your teeth go, and I had a lady in Fremont hand-painted a dozen cups and saucers that match some hand-painted plates that are in there, and you can interchange those with the, uh, with the ones that belong to the set. Not only did Dad buy Mom nice things, but Mom, I can remember going to Wellington. I suppose I was maybe 10 years old, and we drove down to Wellington, Ohio, and Miss Tissett had painted the fire screen that is in front of the fireplace now. And I remember she paid $125 for it. Well, I suppose in 1925 that was probably a lot of money. And the thing that I remember... Most about, and I've always remembered, but when we were coming home on what is now Route 20, we were busy talking and we missed the corner at Busy Corners, the turn, and we ended up in Woodville and had to come home the river road. Okay, what about your fur coat? Oh, that was a big deal. When I went to Detroit to work, my goodness, I was making $90 a month. I had money to burn. So when I was home uh, at I suppose a few days off or something that we got every so often on it during the month. I went to Schwabe's and had a fur coat made, a Hudson Seal. And it's still in the closet. I guess it's wearable. But um, all the years that we went to Arizona, I didn't need it and I don't think about it now. But I'll have to get it out and take a look. So I guess they last a lifetime. But that was a big investment. Okay, now what about Ken and uh, John going to Culver? Uh, John graduated from Elmore High School in 1928, and at that time Ken had just finished his sophomore year. My father had graduated from Culver Military in 1903, and his younger brother Paul also graduated from Culver. So Dad wanted the boys to go there, and Ken went two full years. He went to winter school, which was military school, and naval school for two summers. And, uh, and John went to junior college for two years. 
And during that time, um, we would go down for different fancy things that they had, dances and and reunions and such. And it was a beautiful campus. Um, let's see, I was how much younger than Ken? I have to figure that out, 1928. But anyway, I remember I had my first formal, and it was a pink-flowered organdy, and it had tears, ruffles, and a skirt, and the bodice had a big collar. I can remember that. That was the first formal that I ever had. And one of the dances, for years I remembered the cadet's name, but I couldn't tell you now what it is. When we went to the mess hall at midnight for a lunch, he gave me one of the little pictures that they always had on their table, and I still have it. And my brothers already said, I thought he bought it. My brother said, well, he didn't buy it. He just simply took it. But when the boys were in school, the waiters had their own little cubby hole and knew exactly how much silverware and the dishes that they had and before the boys left the table, everything was counted. And if there was anything missing, they had to sit there at attention until whoever had the missing piece produced it. So there wasn't any stealing, but I guess the alumna didn't make that much difference. But it was a beautiful campus, and I was on Lake Max and Cucky, and when, of course, Ken knew how to sail, and the one summer when we were there, where he took Dad out in the sailboat, and. For some reason or other, the boat tipped over, so they both got wet. But Dad was a swimmer, and so was Ken, so there was nothing bad that happened with that. And, um, but I liked the Black Horse Troop. They had beautiful black horses, and they had riding shows in the, in the uh, building. And kind of smelly, but they were beautiful horses. They still have that. Is that where Lisa gets it? Lisa, I don't know. Lisa Could likes her, and you and yeah. you liked. I never knew you liked horses. I don't want to be near them, but I oh, think you don't they're pretty. Them. Oh, okay. Okay, tell me about when you and Dad were first married. He came home on Sunday. You were married on Tuesday. We went down to Lakeside and stayed all night at um, Aunt Lou's cottage, and I had club the next day. We had to be back for that. You couldn't miss club? No, I was the hostess. Oh. I was the hostess. Oh. And Mrs. Tag had baked apple pies. And that night, Laurel Damshutter walked across the street over to Mrs. Tag's and said, Did you know, you know, Sarah Grace was married tonight? And Mrs. Tag said, Oh, my goodness, and I baked these apple pies. What will I do? Well, anyway, we got the apple pies and I had club. But no, Dad was never particularly fond of study club for some reason or other. <laughs> but I don't remember how long he was home on furlough. But I didn't work after um, Dad and I were married. Um, probably that big government compensation that he got was more than I'd had before. So, But we managed. We lived here. Um, and Mom was here part of the time and part of the time she was not and not too long after we were married uh, a friend of mom and dad's Ernie Myers was in the hospital and he had leg amputation and I stayed all night with him and when I came home in the morning mom said that Julianne had been uh, sick most of the night. Grandma had stayed up with her and she said long tired morning why she was quiet. So I thought well I'll do something in the bedroom and keep watch on her. I didn't know what was the matter. So I remember I washed the bedroom wall and she was just morbid. So I called Dr. Skideman over Genoa and he said to bring her over. So I took her over there he stood her up in front of the fluoroscope and he said, she's got a rotten gut. And he said, who do you want to do surgery? Well, the only one I knew that I would have would be Fred Douglas. 
So he called and Dr. Douglas had had a, car, a heart attack that weekend and he said that a Dr. McNamara was taking his calls. And I said, well, if McNamara was good enough for Douglas, he was good enough for me. So we took her in and she had surgery and uh, the Red Cross brought Mel back home and I sat there day and night for six weeks and I don't remember, I suppose Mel was probably there three or four weeks and she was near death the whole time. She had 12 blood transfusions and three surgeries and the last time when she came down from, doctor, from surgery, I remember Dr. McNamara saying, I've done all I can do. She's in greater hands than mine. And I had never heard a doctor say that before. And I'm sure that when she came home just before Christmas, she was in the hospital six weeks. I'm sure when she came home for Christmas that they weren't sure that she was still going to make it, but she did. And she's been, was pretty healthy the rest of her day. She's had problems in later years, but um, she's been a blessing all the way around. And I believe that at some point that uh, you wrote Dr. McNamara. I don't remember. I think you did after Rick was born. I think oh. you wrote. And um, that he was a he was a wonderful doctor, and he never failed. Whenever he would see me, he would always ask um, about Julianne, and that's more than most doctors do. They forget who they had.